All right. Well, I'm going to ask you to go in your Bible to Ecclesiastes chapter number 11. That's going to be our text today. We'll be there in just a moment. But first, we're going to have a word of prayer. So happy to invite or have our viewers listening from afar as well. Join us by video today. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we lift up our hearts with great delight already. What a great God you are. Thank you for leading us all the way. And thank you for the joy that we have along the way because you're part of our lives. Thank you for your mercies. Thank you for this hour in which we can open up the Word of God together. During these next moments, may you get the focus and attention. Lord, deliver us from distraction and other events of this week past or the week to come and help us just to focus on you right now. And Lord, would you speak to our hearts? Lord, uh, we're inclined just to get in a, in a, a rut and just do what we've always done. And Lord, I just pray that you'd speak through me to the hearts of each person here and accomplish your goodwill in our lives. Thank you again for this hour. Thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. It has been said that no matter where you go in the world, there is no place like home. Imagine traveling the world over, visiting exotic Asian ports, walking on the Great Wall of China, beholding the majesty of the Matterhorns, or perhaps floating down the mighty Amazon. And after all that has been explored and all the pictures have been taken and the albums put together, really there is no bed that sleeps quite like your own when you get home. Over the last few weeks, we've actually done kind of a world tour with Solomon. He's taken us around to visit different locations that would seem exotic, satisfying, and fulfilling. But everywhere he looks, he keeps coming up with the same kind of frustration and emptiness. As I said a few messages ago, they were like all empty holes, whether it was wisdom, power, money, or even women. How uh, how much frustration Solomon found in all of these endeavors. Not one of them satisfied him. So he kept looking, and this book is a quest for man's ultimate question. What is the meaning of life? Why am I here? What is the purpose? And he begins to share his discovery with us, beginning in the end of chapter number 2 and leading in chapter number 3, where we had what is called the God Explosion, what I called the God Explosion. And from that point on, Solomon began to identify some areas in which each of us could get more out of life. And I know this is review for some of you, but review aids learning and it drives it deeper into our minds so we don't forget. This isn't just a series on the calendar. This really is the passion of my heart I, I read a book about this that I shared a couple of years ago. It's been almost three years ago, and it was dry, dynamically impacted my focus in life. Because like you, I have times of discouragement and despair, and that's because I'm looking in the wrong place. And Solomon is teaching us where to look. He is telling us that we need to look in the right places to get more out of life. And most of our pursuits in life are chasing the wrong hole. We're looking down an empty mine shaft. What did he tell us or what have we learned in our series so far? If we want to get more, we need to enjoy God's good gifts to us. And we've identified they're the simple gifts regardless of your economic level. Food and drink and, and work and income and, and having family to share it with. These are treasures that God gives uh, almost every person in the world to, in fact, we could say every person in the world to some degree enjoy these simple gifts. Then we notice next that we need to fear God's name because it helps us to live rightly, it helps us to worship rightly, it helps us to obey His commands. This is what Solomon is emphasizing in this book, walk in the fear of the Lord. And then last week we considered a third Probably subservient to the other two, but still an important point. Solomon doesn't rule out the value of wisdom. Walk in God's wisdom, and you'll avoid many of the pains and pitfalls. Or as I ended the message last week, it, describing landmines and that little rat that could sniff the landmines out. If you walk in God's wisdom, you can sniff out the landmines and avoid major destruction and catastrophe in your life. These are the emphases of the book of Ecclesiastes. And I have chosen really to run a thematic approach. There's no 
problem with doing an expository study. That's just not the way I've approached the book. We have looked at it, grouping verses together under these three headings. To get more out of life, I need to enjoy God's gifts, the ones that are really going to be around my table even today. And I need to fear God's name. And I need to worship and have respect for Him because that orients me correctly to get the most out of life. And I need to walk in God's wisdom. And so Ecclesiastes is full of these little Proverbs, like the book of Proverbs, that give us instruction for life. Did you notice, though, on this list on the board, they all come back where? All come back to God. And I could just imagine that there's more than one skeptic, either watching me remotely by video, maybe more than one in this room who's going, oh, there he goes along, uh, there he goes again preaching the party line. It's church, so it's always got to be about God, God, God. Surely there has to be more to life than that. In fact, I know a lot of people who seem to be getting just along just fine without him. Why does it always have to be about him? So maybe you wouldn't quite say it that way, but there might be a part of your personality that's parked right there. So let's just deal with that a little bit today. I don't imagine there's anybody who would outrightly tell me that, at least in attendance at this service, but I think Solomon anticipated that among the visitors to his kingdom, and there are no doubt some people who think that way today. And I think that's why Solomon when he begins to wrap up the book of Ecclesiastes, goes right back to God. That's really what we find in chapter number 11. Solomon is getting back to God, who is the center of it all. In fact, if God is at the center of everything, you really can't get the most out of life if you leave Him behind. Let me show you, and uh, let's begin with Ecclesiastes chapter number 11 and verse number 9. Ecclesiastes 11 and verse number 9. Uh, no, let's read verses 1 to 6. Ecclesiastes 11, 1 to 6. Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Give a portion to seven and also to eight, for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. If the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if the tree fall toward the south or toward the north, in the place where the tree falleth, there it shall be. He that observeth the wind shall not sow, and he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. As thou knowest not what is the way of the Spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. In the morning sow thy seed, and in the evening withhold not thine hand, for thou knowest not whether shall, whether shall prosper, either this or that, or whether they both shall shall be alike good. All right. Let's um, peel back the veneer of some of these uh, words and verses and see if we can get at the point of what God's really after in this passage of Scripture. And we're going to begin with verse number five. I think the first point that Solomon has made in this book, and he keeps coming back to, is that God made it all. This God that we're talking about in this book is the maker of everything. And we see it in verse number five. Even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. In fact, in just a couple more verses, in verse, uh, chapter number 12 and verse number 1 we read, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth. Solomon, as he's wrapping this book up, we're almost to the end, he's reminding us that God made everything. Now I think this is a very basic Sunday school level understanding. And most people in the room are not going to have a debate with me about God being the first cause, the first actor, the Creator. But secular humanism is rooted today in humanism, and that is the leading thinking in our world today. The teaching that living things slowly have arisen from non-living things over millions and millions of years. And this has been pushed down our throats on every documentary, in every single scientific museum, and in every classroom in the country today, almost without exception. The result of this indoctrination of our young people 
from kindergarten to graduate school is that we have a society that's largely ignorant of God and even hostile to mentioning having his name mentioned in public. And we see that in the denunciation of the Ten Commandments, in the ripping down of uh, any monument, memorial in our country to the name of God. Yet the existence of the Creator, Solomon really isn't arguing for that. I think he's anticipating that most of the people in his world realize that this world didn't get here by accident, that there was a God. Instead, the focus of Solomon's instruction about the Creator is this, he made it all. There isn't anything that you're going to discover in life that he isn't behind. He is the creator of everything. In fact, in John chapter 1 and verse number 3, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. God made it all. Even the things we can't investigate. In in verse number 5, he talks about the way of the Spirit. How How do you explain how the Spirit of man animates the body and how the Spirit disappears at the time of death? How do you explain that? How do you explain the bones forming inside a woman's womb. That doesn't make sense. How, how does that happen And in such a short period of time? Beyond the, the view of humanity at that time. And Solomon said, God made it all. You know, if you put this together you, and you think about it for a moment, when you rule out God as a creator, you open a, a world of great despair. If I got here by accident and chance processes, If there is no reason for me being here other than biology and natural science made it happen, and there's nowhere I'm going because I just live and I die, and when I'm dead, I'm gone, and that's it. Is it any wonder there's so much despair in the world? Is it any wonder that people don't have a sense of purpose? Is it any wonder that people are taking their lives, that life doesn't make sense when you leave God out? So God is at the center of everything, and if you're going to get that, you really have to start at the root, at the very beginning, and it starts with the fact that God made it all. A leading atheist of our day, Richard Dawkins, has the audacity to call religion child abuse. I tell you, it is abusive to tell people there's no God, and it's abusive to tell them they're just a higher advanced degree of slime, just like every other creature, and there's no reason for you being here, that's abuse, and we're seeing it in shootings in school, and the disregard for human life, and the cutting down of of truth from God's Word, we're seeing it, that's abusive, and he's got it the wrong way round. Our ability to get more out of life is to understand that there is a plan, that there is a planner, We were made on purpose, for a purpose. It really does all come back to God. He really is at the center of everything. And I really can't do life if I leave out the center. Wheels don't turn on my car unless there's an axle. Pull out the axle and the wheels fall off. My car goes nowhere. And so the person who leaves God out is going nowhere in life. Solomon is making a point here, not just that God made everything, but he's very specific in verse number 1 of chapter 12. He says, remember now thy creator. He calls him thy creator. We would say in English today, he is your creator. He made you. Not just that he made everything, but I mean, he knows about you. He made you just the way you are. He made each of us unique, and we're all as unique in our personality and our skills and our abilities and our health as unique as our fingerprints on our hand. I'm quoting another Bible teacher who writes, He gave some people amazing athletic abilities. He made others relatively uncoordinated. This is somebody else, right? I'm not saying this. To some, he gave the capacity to sing with sonorous beauty while others struggle even to approximate the correct pitch. Some have keenly analytical minds, but others work hard to comprehend even rudimentary concepts. Some people enjoy near-perfect health, while others develop one chronic disease after another. And how this, and how you got formed, and how it all worked out isn't chance circumstances. There is a distributor a manager, a controller who's putting into you everything you wanted to be there. From your looks to your skills to your health, it wasn't your plan but his. Most of us would change something about ourselves. 
All right, I have about five things on my list. All right, but uh, we would change something about ourselves. But what a relief it is to know that while I may not like something about myself, and other people may even be critical of me and say that's a weakness, and I have plenty of them, God made me just the way he wanted me to be for a plan because he does have a plan for me. That means my life matters. So rather than this whole idea of creation and creator just being an incidental truth, it's absolutely central to Solomon's argument. That's why he ends the last chapter, remember now thy creator. That is not the word he's used most of the times in the book. He uses the name of God, Elohim, more than 40 times. But he wanted you to recall the creator because this God made it all. So when it comes to life, all of it comes from God, and without the Creator, I cannot really understand why I'm here. There's a second truth that Solomon spends time with in chapter 11, and it's actually the most critical truth, I believe, that he's trying to get across, and I've already hinted at it. But I'm, I'm going to hold you in suspense for just a little while longer on point number two, all right? So the creation principle... It's present in chapter 11, but it's not the main point. It's really overshadowed by a more important point, but to get at it, we kind of need to walk through quietly, look at each of these verses. Now let's have a little bit of fun. Let's dissect, all right? Let's do inductive study, right? Rather than me tell you what it says, you're gonna help me figure it out. All right, here we go. Chapter number 11, verse number one. The Bible says, cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Verse 2, give a portion to seven and also to eight, for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. Now, I used to cast bread when I was a kid upon the waters when I went with my grandparents out to the lake to feed the fish. How many of you ever fed fish before? Isn't that fun? A recent visit to my parents' house back in um, Pennsylvania, we actually, they actually took dog food and fed the fish with it, and they just went bananas we had fish just jumping out of the water to get to it. It was incredible. I'd never seen anything like that in my life. However, this is not what Solomon's talking about. <laughs> just thought a human interest story would be fun, all right? Probably what he means here, when you cast your bread upon the waters, it means you fill up a cargo ship with grain. And this happened in the Roman Empire. Solomon predates the Roman Empire by, you know, a thousand, almost a thousand years, 500 years. But... Uh, you put grain on a ship and you sail, send it across the sea to another port and you hope to make money off of it. We call this a business investment. But you can't predict what's going to happen to that boat because that boat could sail and a storm could hit it and all the grain could end up at the bottom of the ocean. But that doesn't keep the businessman from loading up another boat and sending the boat on the water because if he never casts out his bread upon the waters, he can't ever hope to get a return. Right? This is true. You've got to invest. You've got to work. So he's talking about investments. How about the next verse? Give a portion to seven and then also to eight. What does that have to do with investment? Well, when you invest, most people will tell you when you invest, don't put all your eggs in one basket. You need to diversify. So put part of your money in seven different places or even eight. The number doesn't matter. It's just the idea of diversification. If you want to, to, to make a profit, you ought to diversify. Why? Why should you diversify? Because you don't know what's going to happen. I mean, one of your business investments may skyrocket. Another one might be, suffer from coronavirus and tank on you. So you have to diversify. All right, that's just common uh, investment or business sense. But it's really hinting at something else that lies behind why I have to do it that way. Why would an investor have to spread out his investment? Why does, why does the business person, whether you're in grain business or some other business, does he have to send out his bread with the hope of a return? Because he doesn't know if there will be a return because it's out of his all right, let's look at the next verse. If the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And the tree fall toward the south or toward the north, and the place where the tree falleth, there it shall be. You read a verse like that and you go like, huh? That's like that old adage, you know, like, 
if a tree falls and no one's around, did it make any noise? You know, could, could, it just sounds pretty silly. Wherever the tree falls, whether to the south or to the north, there it shall be. Doesn't that sound silly to you? It does, because we have no blank over where the tree falls. We have no control. And that's really clear when you look at the beginning. If the cloud of the verse I'm talking about, if the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. Well, that's true. Typically, unless you live in Tucson, the clouds can be full of rain (laughs) and they move right over your neighborhood and drop all the water on the next neighborhood over. Right? He's giving two examples in verse number three about our inability to control what happens in nature. We can't make the water fall on our field. It could skip our field entire, entirely and fall on some atheist field a mile away. Now, that ain't fair. All right? But that's because I'm not in control. Hey, I would love a tree to fall on my property as long as it didn't hit my house so I could, you know, saw up and have some firewood and I could do something with it. But the tree, that same tree might fall on my neighbor's property and he might get all the firewood. Because I have no control. You see what Solomon said? He gave an example from the business world, investing. Now he's giving it two examples from the natural world. All four examples that we've just talked about in the first three verses all show that mankind has no control. Verse number five, as thou knowest, what is the way of the spirit? Uh, I'm sorry, knowest not what is the way of the spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child. Now, when a lady gets pregnant, most of the time, there's a great excitement. Woohoo! A baby is on its way. This is what we wanted to happen. That's the way it ought to be. You know, if you wait, young person, and you just do it God's way, man, there's no embarrassment. Oh, there's no fear. There's no front. This is what's supposed to happen. Two people get married, they have babies, and the population goes on, and God is celebrated. You do it a different way? Oh, what do we, we got, we got to hide it. Nobody can find, what about, what if your parents, what? You take the joy all out of a good thing. So, all right, that really wasn't in the message. That was just for free. All right. <laughs> So you don't know, verse 5, you don't know how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child. I mean, we understand a little bit about pregnancy, but we can't make the bones form and put them in the right place and have a, ba- a bouncing baby boy or girl in nine months. That really is something that is beyond our... All right, did you get the point? I mean, can you see it? It's right. He's, he's blasting this out. At the center of everything is God. And at the center of this universe, God rules and it's all, everything you can think of, whether it is your business investing that you hope to make money or the natural world and the formation of a child in a woman's womb, it's all beyond your control. So this God is in control of everything. Sounds a lot like what Jack has told me. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm out of order, sorry. Jack has told me some neat things. Let me just tell you, I already brought his name up. Talking about business, back to verses one and two, about putting your money in the boat, Jack has told me numerous times, if you never start the race, you can't finish it. So Jack's always about getting us started. That's what needs to happen in business. You're not going to make a profit because you're not in control unless you at least get in the race and get going. All right, that was for free. That was out of place, but here we go anyway. All right, God is in complete control. Now you've got the idea here. God's in control of every human affair. Let's look around at more of the everything that's under God's management. All right, so we've talked about business. We've talked about nature. Let me give you some other examples that Solomon gives in the book that shows that God is in control of everything. He's in control of your times. Look at chapter number 9. Ecclesiastes 9, back a page or two. Look at verse number 12. For man also knoweth not his time. Did you see that? For man also knoweth not his time. What does he mean? 
Is he, for God has watched? No, you, we understand in the next part of the verse, as the fishes that are taken in an evil net, and as the birds that are caught in the snare, so also the sons of men are snared in an evil time when it falls suddenly upon them. What's he talking about? Death. It just sneaks up. We, we didn't get to pick our birthday, and we don't get to pick the day of our death. Psalmist says in Psalm 31 and verse number 15, our times are in thy hand. Does that disturb you? It really should be a comfort to you, and it should help you to relax. Someone else controls the calendar. I know the doctor could say to you this next week, according to his calendar, you only have three months, or you might have two years. But that really is immaterial because the one who holds the calendar is the God of the universe, not the doctor in the office. So why am I so up, uptight about running out of time or running out of money in my retirement? God knows my times are in His hand. Recently, there's been a lot of concern about COVID, the spread of disease. We can't predict who's going to get it, when they're going to get it, whether they'll recover or not. But as a Christian, I can relax if God is in control. He is not alarmed by the possibility of my getting COVID. I will either get it or not. I will either recover or not, but it won't be random, and it won't, it's no reason for alarm because he is in control. My times are in his hand. Paul said it this way in Romans chapter 14, verse number 8, and it's coming up on the screen now. Whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. He is the center of it all. He's not only in control of my time on earth, he's also in control of my fortunes. A lot, a lot of, whether you suffer good fortune or bad fortune in the world is really beyond your control. In, in chapter number 2, in verse 26, the Bible says, For God giveth to a man that is good in his sight wisdom and knowledge and joy. God gives good things to people. Chapter 5 of Ecclesiastes, verse 19 says, is this on the screen? It is. Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth and hath given him power to eat thereof, to take his portion and rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. See, God has given, he hath given you riches and wealth and power. And we've looked at this verse before. My fortune, my good fortune is in his hands. It can all be traced back to him. He may give me a lot or not. He may give me a little and you much, but so what? He is the supplier. He is in charge of distribution, and I can be grateful. I should be grateful as a Christian for the distribution of what he gives me in his wisdom in my life, whether or not I have the same thing as someone else in this room. Really? He is in charge of my fortunes. He is in control of all. Again, I'm quoting one of my friends on the shelf. Think about how little of your life you actually control. You did not choose where you would be born, yet the location of your birth shaped the entire story of your life. This impresses me every time I travel abroad. What would my life have been like if I had been born on, a, on the violent streets of Belfast, or in the filth of the ghetto in New Delhi, or in a tiny flat in Moscow, or an apartment in Seoul? You did not choose the family where you were going to be born into, but how could any decision be more important than that? You did not choose what period of history you would be born into, yet it has shaped everything you've experienced. Imagine what your life would have been like if you'd been born to a peasant family in medieval Europe or into the family of an ancient Chinese craftsman. Imagine being born on a wagon train heading for a tract of land in the Pacific Northwest or if you had been a slave born in Pharaoh's Egypt, you had no control, and yet someone did and controlled everything so that you would be born where you were at the time you were for the purpose he had planned. Who's in control? God is in control. This God is your creator. It's absolutely essential you get that so you get life the right way. It's absolutely essential that you understand that this God controls everything that happens. And this is true whether you acknowledge Him or not. Your life will follow His course whether you agree to it or not. Right? Sure, you can rebel and sure, you can choose sinful ways, but He's still the ultimate leader of the plan for your life. 
No person is outside of his control. Hey, my troubles also in this life are in his hands. Chapter number 7, verse 14 says, In the day of prosperity be joyful, but in the day of adversity consider. Consider what? God also has set the one over against the other. God chooses your prosperity and your adversity. So he distributes the troubles we face, the kind and the amount and the timing of them. Some of the things that have happened in your life, the ones that have burdened your heart, may still burden your heart or crush your spirit were beyond your control. Like these, she walked out. Your investment went bust. The doctor said there is no cure. Your house went up in smoke or the government labeled your business non-essential. I have a conversation with my family this week about non-essential businesses. It's all a matter of perspective, right? The mayor might not think my business is essential. The governor might not think my business is essential. But if I don't do business, I go bankrupt. And I go, it's essential to me. So every one of you now can call yourselves essential workers. <laughs> right? Because if I don't work, I don't eat. And I don't pay the mortgage. Every one of you in this room is an essential worker. That's a debate for another stage, but I've made my point. Why is this helpful? Because I may not know the plan, but Solomon and the rest of the Bible assure me there is a plan. Someone is administrating my life. That means everything, even my troubles. I really cannot understand life or manage my way through it without him, which is what Solomon already said in chapter 2. How's my time? I'm running out. If you would, Christian, if you'd let this sit down on you for a moment, there are things that distress you about finances, about relationships, about health. But if you just understood that this God is in control, it, it's going to be okay. He's already planned the journey. He already knows what the final chapter is going to be. So you really can relax. Most of us, many of us, spend too much time uptight, frustrated, and we really need to understand that He is my everything. Ecclesiastes 2.25 says, For who can eat or who else can hasten thereunto? This verse is a textual difference in some of the versions that have come down or the, some of the uh, manuscripts that have come down. I've dealt with it before. The text we hold says more than I, but with one part of one letter, it can read this way as you see it on the screen. For who can eat, let's go back. For who can eat or who else can hasten hereunto without him? We can't do anything without him. I may not always like the decisions God's make. I, I may like to go back and rewind, and many of us do that in our mind. We go, mm, I'd like to go back and rewind and redo that decision. And, and, and maybe that's good instruction so we don't repeat the same mistake again. But the decision that you made was all part of the plan. That's why you made the decision when you did to marry that person, to take that job, to live in that house. And it was all designed by a God who is in control so I can relax. The one who makes and plans my way promised me that he's up to my good, Romans 8, 28. So if God's at the center of everything, you can trust him, only him, to get the most out of life. All right? So my God, my God is the maker of all. My God is in control of all. And that leads me to my last point, which Solomon keeps coming back to. We've already hit it, but we're just wrapping up this book. And so he's coming back to his main themes this God judges all. Now, did you get these verses or these points, right? Everything I'm saying is this universal idea. Everything, all, and it's on purpose. Look at verse number 9, Ecclesiastes 11, verse 9. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth. Let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart and in the sight of thine eyes. But know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. Let's go back to that last phrase. But know that that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. 
Do you catch the universality of what he's saying? God is assuming authority over every single part of your life, beginning, even the end, and everything in the middle. How can anyone presume to do life and do it well on this earth without him? Two things I'd like to call your attention about justice before I'm through. Oft times in this world, Solomon admits, there's a great disparity of justice. It seems like the wicked prosper and the righteous struggle, and it's not fair. Criminals get off with a technicality, politicians pay hush money, and serial killers go undetected. But the flip side of it is also true. Sometimes good people do suffer and the innocent take the fall. We see these disparities in justice and we think, man, this is not right, and it's part of our frustration in this world. But Solomon's answer is Ecclesiastes 7 and verse number 15. I think it's coming up on the screen now. All things have I seen in the days of my vanity. There's a just man that perishes in his righteousness, and there's a wicked man that prolongeth his life in his wickedness. That's disparity. It shouldn't be that way. What's the answer? Solomon says it's the certainty that it ain't over till it's over. Just because a man got away with murder, just because the woman never found justice in the court doesn't mean the matter's forgotten. There is a God who turned the upside down world right side up one day. Count on it. He judges all. There's a certainty about judgment. Solomon says it again in our verse here, Ecclesiastes 11 verse 9, for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. Everything will be judged. Nothing escapes his notice. There's both a blessing and a curse there, right? Nothing escapes his notice. This God judges all. Let that be a warning and a reminder to Christians. God does want to bless you, but he is your judge, and we'll all stand before him one day. So the reality then is that all begins, he's the creator, all ends, he's the final judge with God. So trying to get through life without him is going to leave you and I greatly frustrated in great futility. So it all comes down to this. What's the point? If God is at the center of everything, don't think for a moment you can get through life well without him. Let me finish this way with a moving story, all right? This is 1975 America. The boy's name is Raymond Dunn Jr., he is, because uh, at least the reports about his birth were that he had a, 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 um, a skull fracture and oxygen uh, deprivation during birth that caused severe retardation. So as Raymond grew, the family discovered further and further impairments, such as he was blind, mute, and immobile. He had severe allergies that limited him to only one kind of food a meat-based formula made by Gerber Foods. In 1985, Gerber stopped making the formula and Raymond's mother went frantic. She began to scour the country and brought up all the cases of this one food that her son needed before they disappeared. That was 1985. Those cases lasted her until 1990 when her supply ran out. In desperation, she contacted Gerber Foods and pled with them for help because this was the only food that her son could eat. And without it, he would certainly starve to death. Well, the, the company called a meeting, employees got together, they took unprecedented action, pulled out old equipment and began to manufacture this one kind of baby form, uh, food for her son. It was a, quite a process. They did it all for this one boy. And he survived because of that food for another five years until other medical complications took his life in 1995. In a way, the majority of Americans around you are starving to death. And it's not because they can't get a hold of Gerber. It's because they won't get a hold of God. They have neglected the one thing in their diet that could help them really live. God. Why would anyone, why would anyone who knew what Solomon is saying here about how to get meaning and purpose out of life try to live life 
without God. But there are some in this room who still haven't invited God into their life. You're not against God. You're learning about God. But he's still not part of your life, and you're still missing out on the center of everything. He made you. He will one day judge you, and he is controlling everything right now about you. Would you bow the knee to him and invite him to be your God? And the only way you can do that today is by taking Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. If you've never invited Jesus into your life, he is the way to connect with God so that God becomes the center of your everything. Shall we pause for prayer?